the man who walks in the path of righteousness, the hours as individuals, as families, and as a whole church in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you raise your voice to the Lord and say, Lord, make me that blessed man, that blessed woman, that blessed child of God that comes through walking, walking on the path of righteousness. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for bringing us together. Thank you, Lord, for your people gathered here. Thank you for your people gathered all over this country and continent and beyond this continent. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to share together the joy of being in Christ and the joy of having the promises of good fulfilled in our lives. We we'll pray, Lord, that tonight your blessedness and your glory will be upon the whole church and every individual in the church in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that the word will find an entrance in our heart and it penetrates in our heart, enters our heart. Great will be the effect of that word in every life in Jesus' name. Bless all your people, Lord. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We're looking at Job chapter 17, verse 9. Job chapter 17. We're looking at verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way. And he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. We're talking about the conqueror's purity, the conqueror's holiness, the conqueror's change and transformation of life, the conqueror's sanctification. And we're talking about the power, the strength, the authority and the ability that comes along with that purity of the conqueror. And yet we're told in Job that those who are righteous, those who have been converted, those who are consecrated to the Lord, those who are pure, purged, sanctified, separated from the world, that they will be stronger and stronger. That those who have clean hands and a pure heart, that the strength of the Lord will be manifesting through us, stronger and stronger, greater and greater. Not only that, we are told in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 28. And I'm reading there from verse 1. It says in verse 1, the wicked flee when no man pursues. Well, we need to know that the wicked is being pursued by Satan, being pursued by the consequences of sin. The wicked is being pursued by the judgment of God. The wicked is being pursued by the wrath of the Almighty God. But even when the wicked is not being pursued, when God gives a leeway, a, a kind of little time for him to rethink about his life. Even at that time when Satan and the consequences of sin and the enemy are stopped pursuing, the enemy pursues, the enemy runs and flees when no man is pursuing. But then it says in the second part of that verse, it says, But the righteous are as bold as a lion. That is when you become a conqueror. That is, you have that concrete spirit, and you have that concrete attitude and character, and the grace of God is magnified in your life. It says, when you become righteous, you become bold against Satan, and bold against evil spirit, and bold against every enemy, and bold against every foe, because the righteous, those who are made righteous by the blood of the Lamb, that their righteousness is within and without. Their righteousness is deep within their heart, and then it manifests externally in their behavior and character. Those righteous people are as bold as a lion, the king of the forest. We're looking at Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 10. And we see one of the examples of righteous people, bold people, courageous people, a, a person you cannot turn back, you cannot intimidate, righteous people as bold as a lion. The people out of the power of the conqueror's purity. Daniel chapter 6, I read from verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house 
and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a full time. I'm sure you know the story. All those people conspired together. And they were going to destroy anyone that will pray unto the Almighty God and not make requests before the king. All these 30 days, they said, for a whole month, the king on earth will be the king of heaven. They said, the man will be the God and that everybody shall come to that God. God, that is the God with a small g, a human being, and make all their requests. And anybody who does not do that, who prays to the God of heaven, they'll throw him to the lions. Then, but you must remember the power of a con of conqueror spirit. That is when you have that purity of heart. And when you know that God is behind you, that underneath you are the everlasting arms, there is nothing, nothing to fear. That's why when Daniel knew that the right hand was inside, he knew the conspiracy was very strong. And the conspiracy was backed up by a kind of law of the Middle Persians that changes not. He went into his house and then he opened the windows. He wasn't going to practice religion in secret. He wasn't going to be a secret disciple openly. He wanted to declare to everybody, this is where I stand. I pray God will give you that stand. I say God will give you that stand. That you'll be able to declare to all the conspirators that you stand for Christ. And whatever they will do and whatever they will say, that you're going to abide by this unchanging word of God. It was then they all came and they said, we saw you. We saw you, we saw you, and then they reported it. And then the king felt sorry that the edict had taken hold on Daniel. And then they threw him to the lion's den. All through the night, Daniel remained in the lion's den, and nothing hurt him. There is power in purity. There's power in sanctification. There's power in holiness. When a man is righteous, totally committed unto the Lord, not a lion, not a devil, not an evil spirit, not in Satan, can conquer that man. I rejoice with you tonight as this purity enters your life, pervades your life, infiltrates your life. Nothing will be able to conquer you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it says, My God has sent his angel, and he has shut the lion's mouth, that they have, they have not hurt me for as much. As before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Pure before God and man. Holy and righteous before God and man. Holy and righteous in the public, in the private, in his heart and all his surroundings. So because of that, the angel came and shut the lion's mouth and he could not hurt me. They will not be able to hurt you. As we look at the power of a conqueror spirit, I'm looking at it from three perspectives, subtitles. Number one, the conqueror or the Christian's pursuit of purity. The Christian's pursuit of purity. If there's anything we need to pursue, anything we need to seek after, anything we need to run after, anything we need to pray about consistently and fervently over and over again, it is this purity of heart. The Christian's pursuit of purity. Number two, Christ's prayer and provision for purity. Christ has prayed for us and is still praying for us. And Christ is making the provision for that purity of heart. And then number three is the conqueror's privilege through purity. When you become pure, righteous, holy, sanctified, free from sin, inward and outward, then there's a kind of privilege that comes to you and to your kind of person alone. Number one now. What's number one? I said, what's number one? The Christian's pursuit of purity. You will pursue it. And you will get it in Jesus' name. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're looking at this great man of God. His name is Paul. And we can see his pursuit. 
we can see his desire. We can see, he says, one thing do I desire. That one thing am I seeking after all the days of my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, it tells us, And every man that strived for the mastery is temperate, is self-denying in all things. Now they do each to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under. He said, in my pursuit, in my seeking, in my running after, there's holiness, there's sanctification, continual sanctification, complete sanctification, sanctification for the spirit, for the soul, for the body. He said, in my pursuit of this righteousness, without which no man shall save the Lord, this holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord, I keep my body under. That means I'm keeping my mouth under control, I'm keeping my eyes under control, I'm keeping my legs, my feet under control, I'm keeping my hands under control, I'm keeping my mind under control, I'm keeping my ears under control, I'm keeping my brain, my head under control. I only want to think about what will help me and will help me to pursue and to continue in purity and holiness. He said the whole of my body with all the organs of my body, I keep my body under. And then he says, I'm bringing it into subjection. I do not allow the desires of the body to rule me. I rule the desires of my body. I do not allow the the passion of the flesh to control me, I control the passion of that flesh. I do not allow all the demands of the flesh, all the demands of my body to control me and direct my life. I control everything concerning my body. It says I bring it under subjection, less after Less that by any means, when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a castaway. I pray you'll not be a castaway in Jesus' name. And that means then that in the pursuit of this holiness and righteousness and purity and this uh, in what sanctification, you have something to do. Some things to lay aside, some things to reject, some things to destroy, and then without any hindrance or to, to pursue. This great quality of heart and character, which is the purity of heart, the holiness of heart, which is the transformation in your very nature, in your very heart. And I pray that the Lord will do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. Because without this, whatever else you have means nothing. Without this, whatever else you do means nothing. Without this, whatever it is to acquire will not have any value in the sight of the Almighty. That's why it is the one single solitary thing for you to pursue all the days of your life after you are saved and then you go forward again. You consecrate everything upon the altar and you say, in reality, Lord, I surrender. I surrender all. All within me. All around me. All in my hand. All in my heart all in my vision, all in my dream, I surrender unto you. And with that total consecration, you say the fire from the altar of the Lord shall burn every kind of carnal nature in you, and then it sanctifies you and purifies you and purges you and makes you holy within, holy within and without. And then after that, even after that sanctification experience, you're still pursuing that I will grow in that sanctification. You are pursuing, I will grow in that holiness. You are pursuing, I will grow in a purity of heart. It is that kind of person. It is that kind of believer that on the final day, he'll be able to see the Lord in glory without any shame and without any reproach. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. Here is Paul the apostle telling all the believers that even though you are saved, praise the Lord. You are sanctified, praise the Lord. You are filled with the Holy Ghost, praise the Lord. But some things will try to derail you. To destroy you, to come back into your life. Some of those things that were given up were said no more. Will try to come back to your life. And he said, Lay it aside that let us lay aside every wage and the sin which does so easily beset us. You know, the sin that does easily beset is different from one to the other. For Abraham is different 
For David is different. For Achan is different. For Samson is different. For Solomon is different. And he says, whichever one is peculiar to you, that is likely to catch up with you and get you back again and get your face in the mud again, that you lay aside every sin that does so easily beset you. And let us run with patience the fade race that is set before us. I pray God will give you the grace to run. I said you were on the race that is set before you. Then he says, he was still looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. He said, so the tempter will come, the trials will come, and the people that want to oppose your progress in the Christian life, they will come. He says, but remember Jesus Christ, our forerunner, Jesus Christ, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our sanctifier, Jesus Christ, our model, Jesus Christ, the one that went before us, he said, he endured such great contradiction of sinners. He said, if he did that, you need to do that too, for he says, in verse, in verse, um, in verse 3, he says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Let's see, be weary and faint in your mind. You will not faint. You will not be weary. You'll keep on pursuing until that holiness that God gives is a kind of consummated in your life in Jesus' name. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. I was told in Galatians, Chapter 5, after you come to know the Lord, you are born again, you are a real child of God. Now, you cannot relax and say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. Praise the Lord, I'm sanctified. No more pursuit, no more strive, no more fighting against the flesh, no more trying to resist the devil and trying to resist all those temptations. I'm saved. And sanctified, and the Spirit of God dwells with him. He says, Yes, even though that is true, that the pursuit must continue. In Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading there, verses 16 and 17. It says, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. The flesh. The natural self, the old nature, your propensities, your tendencies, and the possibilities of the past life will try to contend and fight against the priest, the power and the presence of the spirit in your life. For the flesh lusteth, fighteth, striveth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that she would. That's why the battle continues, the fight, the fight continues, and you will not fail, you will not fall in this fight in Jesus' name. In Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. Galatians chapter 1 verse 14. He said, I profited in the Jewish religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the, of the traditions of my fathers. You know, sometimes um, it may be the tradition of your fathers that you're trying to contend for, you're trying to fight, you're trying to maintain, and that goes against your progress of the Christian life. It may be the tradition of some people that have gone before you, and you say, this is what you do, and this is what you preserve. And Paul, Paul the apostle was uh, talking about his fathers that were long dead, the Jewish fathers. The Jewish patriarchs, they are gone already. And this is a new day that we are preaching Christ and exalting Christ. But there were those fathers and their legacy was still lingering on. 
And all that he stood for the attraction was still lingering on. And he said, when I knew these Nazarenes, that is, these Christians, when I knew the people that are following the way, and I felt they are not following the tradition of our fathers, he said, I pursued those people. I was zealous for the tradition of my fathers. When you look at your heart, you ask yourself, what am I fighting for? What am I pursuing? What am I trying to defend? What am I trying to uphold? Are you upholding Christ? Or are you upholding the tradition of your fathers? The tradition of the people that are dead? The tradition of the people that are no more here? Are you holding on to the watch of the living God? The watch that never changes because he says, I'm God, I change not. And Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Is that what you are contending for? You are contending for the tradition of your fathers that are long gone. We must earnestly contend for the faith delivered unto the saints, not for the traditions of any elder. We're going to stand on the word of God in Jesus' name. As we sang, hold the forge. I'm coming soon. Jesus whispers to you. It's not saying it is something you hold on to the tradition of any of your fathers or your mothers. It's saying that you hold what he gave us, what Jesus Christ gave. And then we said, wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace we will. We're not contending for tradition. We're contending for the truth. The truth of salvation. And the truth of holiness and the truth of the power in the Holy Ghost. And to the end, we're going to stand by that in Jesus' name. But thank God the light came to Paul the Apostle. The light is coming to you. I said the light is coming to you. And then when the light came unto him, he had a choice either to come to the side of Christ or to keep on contending for the tradition of the elders of the fathers. That's why it says in verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Flesh and blood will try to fight against your progress, but I pray you will overcome. He said, I consented not, I agreed not, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And I want to inherit the kingdom of God. I'm sure you want to inherit the kingdom of God. And when flesh and blood will rise up to fight against this pursuit of holiness and righteousness and purity. In your personal life, in the family, or in the church at large. That, you know, some people will say, enough of that, enough of holiness. Oh, it's not enough. We need it to be able to enter heaven. Enough of this sanctification beat is not enough. We need that sanctification to get to heaven. They want this and this and that. And when any contention will come, that the Lord will help you. That this truth of holiness of heart and life, you will hold on to it until the very end in Jesus' name. It tells us in First Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, be sober, never be frivolous. Never be careless, never be superficial, never be lousy, never be a person that will say is an unserious un Christian, a Christian that is not sober, a soldier on the battlefield, on the front line, that is jesting and joking, a soldier on the front line that forgets himself and forgets that he's on the battlefield. Never be like that. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This is not the time to be careless when near the coming of the Lord. This is not the time to be careless. The spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in the world. This is not the time to be careless. The devil wants to take your privilege and everything you've got. That's the reason it says be sober, be vigilant. Because that adversary, the devil, as a running lion, is seeking whom he may destroy. He will not destroy you. 
whom we receive steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The people who have gone back into the world, they face affliction, they can never be able to overcome or sum out, but you will overcome. In First Timothy chapter six, First Timothy chapter six, I'm reading there from verse nine. First Timothy chapter six, verse nine. The things that battle against our progress, the things that war against our progress, that we need to fight against. You don't fight against your neighbor fight against your brothers, fight against your sisters, but you fight against carnality in your own life. You fight against the tempter that comes to destroy your Christian life, that comes to take your conviction away. You fight the flesh and the blood within you that tries to take away what you have. That's why it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 9, it says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. If you know what the people who are running after, instead of running after holiness, they're running after money, after wealth, after property, after cement and sand and stone and mortar. They're running after the things of this world. And that's why it says you beware if your goal is still heaven, if your goal is still glory. If your goal is still the promised land, it says, But they that will be rich fall into his into temptation is near and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, any man of God here tonight? Any woman of God here tonight, this is the message to you and to me, to every one of us. But thou, O man of God, O woman of God, O child of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness and pursue righteousness and follow after godliness, pursue godliness and follow after faith and pursue faith and follow after love and pursue love and follow after patience and pursue patience and then follow after meekness and pursue meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. The Lord is telling us that if there's anything we need to run after, that is it. Purity, holiness, sanctification, that quality of character that leads us and prepares us for the coming of the Lord, even for heaven. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 is a fight to fight, a race to run, when a battle on the battlefield. And because of the battlefield, it says pursue, pursue the enemy that will take your heritage away. Pursue the enemy that will take that holiness of life, holiness of heart away. Pursue that enemy that will try to take from you the thing that gets you ready for heaven. Fight against it. In Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3, now therefore... And your hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you'll not get to heaven on a bed of roses. You'll not get to heaven by taking it easy. I don't want to fight against Satan. I don't want to fight against my natural propensities. I don't want to struggle against anything. Whatever comes, I swallow. Whatever comes, I submit. Whatever comes, I give in, I give up. You never get to heaven that way. You endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet is he not crouched except a strive lawfully. The Lord is telling us, fight against those things that will try to impede or stop or delay or slow down your onward journey towards heaven. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 10. Finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord. You will be strong. And in the power of His might, 
put on the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand against the wiles and the strategies and the maneuvering of the devil. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that means against our neighbors, against our countrymen, we are not trusting against any human being, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. That's what it takes to be able to pursue and have this purity. All through your life, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand in the evil day, and have done all to stand. I rejoice with you with the whole armor of God. You are going to stand in Jesus' name. Nothing can beat, and nothing can defeat, and nothing can destroy this great army of God that is seeking after this holiness of heart. And they have just one thing. They say, take all the world. But I'm going to keep this spirit. You take everything you can take out of me. But this holiness and this righteousness and this quality of life that gets me to heaven, nothing is going to take it out of my heart, out of my hand, out of my mouth, out of my life, out of my lifestyle. And when you make up your mind that way, it says then you'll be able to withstand an evil day and you will stand victorious in Jesus' name. In verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins got about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench how many darts of the wicked one? all the dads of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the, and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying always you'll pray always when the challenges come you'll pray when mountains confront you you're going to pray when tempters and temptresses when they confront you you're going to pray when the old nature is trying to come back you will pray and it says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit you pray with your mind you pray with your spirit you pray with your understanding you pray in the holy ghost watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all sins if we do that we're going to overcome. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2. We're looking at it in verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Tell me out loud. Can I hear you again? Everyone that nameth the name of Christ departs from evil. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. I will be a vessel unto honor. If a man, in verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself, if a man therefore purge himself, if a woman therefore purge herself, if a believer therefore purge himself, if somebody on his way to heaven, on his way to glory, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Verse 22, flee also youth for lost, flee also youth for lost, flee also youth for lost. Yeah, Paul the Apostle, at his, he was beyond 60 when he was writing this about, in fact, this was the last epistle that he wrote, where before he died, and yet in, at old age, he said, useful laws, they still try to come back even in old age. Remember, the time that David fell, he wasn't a teenager. The time that David fell, he wasn't a below 30 years of age. The time that David fell, he was almost an old man already about to enter the grave already and yet he still fell that's why it says whether you are young or old in your teenage years or your 20s or your 30s or your, your 40s or 50s or 60s or 70s even in your 80s 
It says you'll still flee all this youthful laws, but follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I pray that this pursuit of purity will never leave you in Jesus' name. We'll never leave your family in Jesus' name. I will never leave this church that heaven calls deep and light, Bible church. This pursuit of purity will always be in this church until we see the Lord face to face in Jesus' name. But you want to know that Christ has prayed for us. He prayed for purity. He prayed for our holiness. He prayed for our sanctification. That's why I come to point number two now, Christ's prayer. And provision for purity. John, Gospel according to St. John, chapter 17. Gospel according to St. John, chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 9. John, chapter 17, verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. This special prayer is not for the worldly. It's not for the worldly. It's not for the people that their hearts, their mind is all over in the world. It's not for the people that don't have any goal of heaven. This is for the heavenly minded person. For the person that is saying, oh Lord, help me. I don't want to remain trapped in this world when the trumpet shall sound. I want to be able to go with the people of God when the saints go marching in. He said, I'm not praying for the world, this kind of prayer, but I'm praying for them which thou hast given me for they are thine look at verse 20 neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their through their word we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ through the words of the apostles that's how we got saved that's how we got all these blessings of the kingdom. He says, I'm praying for them. What's the prayer? Look at verse 17. It says in verse 17, sanctify them sanctify them the lord will sanctify you if you got it before you'll get it all over again i said you'll get it all over again so that there'll be a kind of new sanctification renewed sanctification you lay everything upon the altar again and say i'm wishing for the fulfillment a greater fulfillment of the prayer of jesus christ for the church the fulfillment of the prayer of jesus christ for the host of believers i want to be a partaker of that sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth and I tell you that Jesus has not stopped praying for you and praying for me and praying for his church. That his church will be pure, his church will be holy, his church will be sanctified, his church will be united in this holiness experience. Look at the passage of scripture that says Jesus is still praying that prayer for us in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 34. Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who is he? That condemnation. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And if you're, if you're a student of the Bible, you can begin to ask yourself, what is the Lord praying about now? Concerning you, concerning me, concerning the church. Because it says, Christ maketh intercession for us. Can we think about it one by one? Is Christ praying for us to have more money? Is Christ praying for us to amass all the sand and all the stones and all the cement of the world? Is Christ praying for us to be able to amass all the wealth of the things of this world? Didn't Jesus say, what shall he profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? That's what he said. He cannot be praying for us to have all the things that will perish. Didn't he say that look at all this temple and look at all the stones? Not one will be laid upon the other. Everything will be destroyed and thrown away. He cannot be praying for us to have the things that are going to be destroyed on the final day. He's praying for the things that abides forever. He's praying for the experience that abides forever. The same kind of prayer that he prayed for his disciples when he was here on earth. That's the kind of prayer. He's still praying for us. Now sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 talking about the prayer prayer that Jesus Christ is still praying for his own disciples even today, for the believers even today. Christ's prayer for our purity, 
for our holiness, for our righteousness, Christ's prayer, for our sanctification is praying for you. I pray that you'll cooperate with Christ. I said you'll cooperate with Christ, and this defect of this prayer will be known and felt and realized and experienced and lived out in your life in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Who are the people? The people who are saved, and he wants to save them to the uttermost. He doesn't want any stain of sin in our lives, any weakness of sin, any reproach of sin, any kind of weakness in sinning. He doesn't want that to remain in us because of that he ever leave it to make intercession for us i think uh, we should praise god because if jesus is praying for us god the father will answer his prayer on my behalf or your behalf on our behalf in jesus name and he ever leave it to make intercession for us to have this kind of experience i'm looking at um, hebrews chapter 9 hebrews chapter 9 i read verse 14 there hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's the provision. We'll say the prayer. Now we'll say the provision is purging us, purifying us, sanctifying us. And it says, it is the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ that does that. I want you to look at Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. The provision that he made for you to have this purity, this holiness, this sanctification and this is what makes you more than a conqueror titus chapter 2 verse 14 who gave himself for us who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a common person a lowly fellow a weak christian what kind of people is he purifying? Peculiar people, zealous of good works. Those are the kinds of people that the blood of Jesus is working on. Thank God is working on you. I said thank God is working on you. He will accomplish that in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. The provision of the Lord for our purity. Provision of the Lord for that inward righteousness and holiness. Provision of the Lord for that sanctification of heart, of character, of mind, of soul, of spirit, of the entire life. In, in um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that she might sanctify. That's the provision. That's why Christ gave himself that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might redeem it unto himself, a glorious church. This church will be a glorious church. Christ will look at this church and say, that's a glorious church. The angels will look at this church and say, that's a glorious church. And Almighty God will look at this church and say, This is the kind of church I sent my only begotten son to the world to go and build. This will be a glorious church in Jesus' name. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. I pray that the Lord who has provided that and prayed for us will accomplish that in all our hearts and lives in Jesus' name. When that is done and he has saved us, when that is done and he has sanctified us, when that is done and he has purified us, what is the result? What is the reward? What is the privilege? Point number three, the conqueror's privilege through purity. The conqueror's privilege through purity. 
What do we have when we're pure? Pure in heart. Pure in our thoughts. Pure in our imagination. Pure in our inner man. Pure in our inner life. Pure in our private life. Pure in our public life. Pure in the office. And pure in the home. And pure in the market. And pure in the school. When we're pure, when you're with the lecturer, you're pure. When you're with, you know, your boss, you're pure. What kind of privilege, what kind of profit, what kind of benefit comes to the people that are pure through and through, morning, afternoon, and evening, that their hearts are already purified, and no matter where they are, in church or outside the church, the purity of life is there. What are the benefits and the profits of the people that have that kind of purity? The conqueror's privilege through purity. We're looking at Psalm 24. In Psalm 24, I read verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Here is what the word of God is telling us. Here is a question in verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? O shall abide, O shall stand in his holy place. David was asking the question about the people that will get to heaven and live in heaven forever and ever. Here is the answer. He that has cleaner hands and a pure heart, their hands are not sticky. Their hands will not pick up money belonging to other people. They have clean hands. And the money of other people must stick to their hands. Their hands are clean. Not only that, they will not touch other people's wives. Their hands are clean. Not only that, they will not touch any abominable thing. Their hands are clean and their hands are clean. Who are the people that will get to that eternal glory? Eternal place of abode that Jesus said... You believe in God, believe also in me, that in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That place has gone to prepare, that is called heaven, a better country, a better city. Who are the people that will get here? There, they that have clean hands. They're not the people that are defiling other people's daughters, and then they get all these teenagers and defile them clean hands and a pure heart. Then he says, the people that have not lifted up their hearts unto vanity and they have not sworn deceitfully. Those are the people that are going to make it. I pray you will make it. I said you will make it. We're looking at Psalm 15. I'm reading from verse 1. The privilege of the people that have this purity, this holiness, this sanctification, and they leave it out. They don't just say, I got it 1998. I was sanctified 1995. Not 1990, not 19 whatever. It is the people that have a present experience, a present day abiding experience, and that holiness of heart and life is still there. Those are the people. The Lord is not coming for the people that were sanctified 20 years ago. He's coming for the people that presently in their life, presently in their heart and presently in their day to day behavior and character that holiness and purity and righteousness is still there it will be there when christ comes in your life in jesus name psalm 15 verse 1 lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle or who shall dwell in thy holy hill he that walketh not the people that walked in the past the good old days when i was pure the good old days when i was sanctified the good old days when i first came to the lord and then the lord purified me the people that walketh they still have that. They're still living like that. They're still living with that purity of heart. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Not the people that, that they color whatever they say. 
Now the people that are looking for some undue advantage and are looking for that through deception and lying. Having the nature of the devil is a liar. Where well, it says, the people that speak the truth in their heart, he that backbites not with his tongue. Not the tail bearers and the backbiters and the gossips, and not doeth evil to his neighbor, not taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that swear to his own heart and changes not. You come to the retreat and then you make consecration, you swear to your own heart. And then you go back home, and you go back to the office and your wife says, uh -uh, You cannot live like that if I'm going to remain married to you. Say, well, I've sworn to my own heart, I change not. Or it may be your husband that say, uh -uh, you cannot live like that. You cannot take that decision here in my home because I am the head of this home. And whatever I tell you to do, you will say, uh -uh, I swore to my own heart. I change not. Or it's a religious man somewhere that will tell you, hey, look at this. This is where your father was born. And it was your father that laid the foundation stone of this church building. You cannot tell you have been born again, born again, born again. Because this is the tradition of your father. Say, uh-uh, I saw to my own heart. And I change not. And the people who are go going to get to heaven, they are not like chameleons. When you are in Rome, do as the Romans do. And then when you are in Jerusalem, do as the Jerusalem people do. They are the people who are consistent. They are the people wherever they find themselves. In Egypt or Babylon. In Israel or in Africa. They say, I swore to my own heart that this is the way to live. And I'm going to live like that. And for the rest of your life, you are a man, a woman of conviction and courage. And you are able to stand by the word of God. You will stand in Jesus' name. I said you will stand in Jesus' name. Now the people, when they were still in school, they were believers, real children of God, and they professed sanctification and holiness. And then when they eventually graduate and get to a place of work, their boss in the place of work will tell them, ah, you cannot carry that one here. I used to know one person going to deeper life. Holiness, holiness, holiness. Sign this. I'll not sign anything with fraud. And then the fellow lost his job. And if you come here and then you say, I'm not going to sign something, be very careful. We know you people. And then the fellow will say, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I'll never say sorry to the devil. I said, I will never say sorry to the devil. Did Moses say sorry to Pharaoh? Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say sorry uh, to Nebuchadnezzar? Did the apostles say sorry to Herod? You know, hey, somebody uh, hey, sign this one and do this one. Uh, sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Me? Look at me very well. I said, look at my face here. I never say sorry to a father of the devil. How about you? I said, how about you? You stand at the rock of Gibraltar and you say, here I stand. I swear to my own heart, I will not change. Am I talking about you? I can't see you. Where are you? Don't hide away in the dark. Let me see your hand. You say, I swear to my own heart, I change not whatever the devil will do. After all, what can the devil do? What can Pharaoh do? Pharaoh will drown in the river in Jesus' name. What can Nebuchadnezzar do? Nebuchadnezzar, he'll go to, he'll go to the forest. Seven seas will pass over him while we're still standing. Standing where we stood many years ago. And when he has gone and come back, he'll say, find Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, and you and me. He'll say, find us standing where we were standing in Jesus' name. And after Herod has gone and eaten of worms, the church will still be standing. Will be standing forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Believers don't cringe. And the believers, they don't bow. They don't submit to the devil or to any messenger of the devil. We say, whether it be right to obey God, rather to obey you rather than God judge you, but we must do, and we must be able to proclaim and say those things we have heard from the Lord. I pray that you will stand like that in Jesus' name. He that swear to his own heart and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury, unlawful game, nor taketh reproach against the innocent, he that doeth such things shall never be moved. You will not be moved in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 5, here are the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5. 
Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. Is it possible to be pure in heart? Is it possible to be pure in life? Is it possible to be pure in the private? Is it possible to be pure in the public? Answer me. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart. What will happen to them? But they shall see God. You will see God. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with some people. How many people? <laughs> Praise the Lord. When the Prince of Peace dwells in your heart, when the Prince of Peace lives and abides forever and ever in your heart, He, the one that dwells in your heart, makes you to follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh, you, you know, sometimes there are people, and I'm sure you've met maybe one or two of them. They were coming to our church here before. And because of the holiness, 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 and we don't talk too much about how to get more money, how to cheat, how to steal, how to be clever, how to do fraud, how to gain unlawfully, how to be able to amass wealth, how to use your contacts so that you'll be able to have all the money you can have. Because we don't talk about that. And we say, every time holiness, holiness, I'm fed up with holiness. I want to, get, I want to go and get some sand and cement. I want to go and get some stones and bricks and blocks. I want to go and get the things that will perish of the world. They leave. And then when you see them outside, say, ah, my friend, what happened to you? I thought I used to see you in our church deep and I'm about to you. He said, yes, I used to be there. But you know, they don't have anything to talk about in that place about heaven. They only talk about heaven, about holiness, about sanctification. And I needed money. Well, we are not poor either. Are we poor? We don't even have the place to pack all the cars we have. We're not poor. Because Jesus said, seek ye first. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what else? What else? All this things shall be added. When God wants to add them, we don't concentrate on that. Because they say, I wanted to look for this. And I say, have you got what you're looking for now? I'm still searching. Why, why don't you come back? And prepare for heaven. When you come back and prepare for heaven and say, Oh Lord, the holiness I dropped many years ago. And I went in search of my right of life. I'm coming back again. And I'm going to have that purity of heart and purity of life again. Then all the other things will be added unto you. That's why it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I pray that you'll follow after the right thing, the things that endure in our lives in Jesus name in first peter chapter one first peter chapter one i'm reading from verse three blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead to an Inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. There are some things reserved in heaven, and it is when we get there, we're going to get them. Your blessings reserved in heaven, you will not miss them in Jesus' name. How do we get them? Verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, tell me, tell me out loud, say that again, with confidence assurance, be ye holy, for I am 
holy. Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth. That purity the Lord will give us. And it says, when that is there, when the trumpet shall sound, and then the dead and Christ shall rise, and the saints go marching in, you'll be one of those saints in Jesus' name. But remember, sinners will never, sinners will never, will never march in. Or the saints, as the saints are marching in, backsliders will never march in. Well, the believers and the believers are marching in when the trumpet shall sound. And it is only those who remain holy and pure and undefiled that will march in. And I pray you'll be one of them. I will be one of them. We shall be people among them in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise, shall be raised incorruptible. And we, everybody say we, say that again, we, and we shall be changed, you'll be part of us in Jesus' name. But 58, therefore, because of that rapture we're expecting, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, you will not serve the Lord in vain in Jesus' name. The Lord has told us today the pursuit of purity, and the provision of purity and the prayer for purity and the great privilege of the people that have this purity and i pray that as the number as the lord counts his own and numbers his own you'll be among the number in jesus name just rise up now and tell the lord oh lord count me count me count me Count me of the people who are saved. Oh Lord, count me. When you count those who are saved, who are sanctified, who are purified, who are made holy, Lord, count me. When you count up those, the people who are going to make it on the day of rapture, Lord, count me. I want to be part of them. Anything that will hinder me, I lay down. I lay aside that purity of heart and that holiness of heart and life. I want to have. I want to have the conqueror's purity and I want to have the power, the strength. I want to have the purpose i want to be able to have the ability the privilege of the people who are pure in heart and pure in soul and pure in mind and pure through and through inside and outside in the private and the public oh lord do it for me right now do everything upon the altar and say lord do it all over again let the fire of holiness burn once again the fire of purity let it burn once again and burn everything out of my life out of my out of my character out of my personality that is not of the holiness of the lord do it for me even tonight in jesus name and the lord will do it open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer and say lord help me lord help me lord help me i want to be holy i want to be pure i want to be sanctified purified purged my soul my spirit my life my inner life no pretense no pretense no pretense no frivolity, no superficiality, no external religion, no pharisaic religion. Through and through, in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, in my inner being, inner man, Lord, do it again. Let the fire of holiness burn. Let the fire come from your altar and burn every chaff and burn every useless thing away from my life do it lord do it lord do it all over again even if you are sanctified before the lord sanctify me sanctify me sanctify me all over again my spirit my soul my mind my will my tendencies my propensities everything my thoughts my mind my imagination my tongue my hand every part of me sanctify purify i lay everything on the altar once again it's a pursuit there's a battle there's a fight and the enemy will try to contain 
contend against your soul, contend against your progress, and contend against the possession and the preservation of that holiness of fatness of life. And you are telling the Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, this is the greatest heritage I have. Let nothing take this away from me. The greatest heritage, the greatest experience, the greatest possession that I have. Let nothing take this from me. Don't pursue money. There are things money cannot buy. Don't pursue property. The things property will not satisfy. Don't pursue the wealth of this world. The things that the wealth of this world will not be able to satisfy. But this holiness of heart and sanctification and purity of heart and life. Lay everything on the altar. And when you make your consecration, make it in such a way that nothing will be able to take it away from the altar. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. He, he or she, that swear to our own hurt and change it not. Whatever you have to lose to keep holiness, whatever you have to give up to keep the purity of heart and life, give them up. And say, Lord, I give it up. Lord, I give it up. Lord, I give it up. Whatever. Just for a few years. So you can preserve the purity of heart. That holiness of heart and life. In your office, remember? I've sworn to my own heart. I change not. In your home, remember? I've sworn to my own heart, I change not. Your local church, remember, when somebody is trying to compromise the truth, when somebody is trying to water down the truth, when a so-called preacher, pastor, leader, walker, is trying to water down the truth, that local church says, I've sworn to my own heart, I change not. And you will not follow a multitude to do evil. You know this indispensable experience. This one thing that I pursue. I want to get to heaven. Willingness of heart. Willingness of life. Purity in your soul. Purity in your spirit, purity within, purity without, purity in the day, purity in the night, purity in your imagination, purity in your thoughts and purity in your life, purity in everything that you do. When church people are there, when church people are not there, holiness of heart and holiness of life. Jesus is praying for you. Let your prayer match the prayer of Jesus. Sanctify them, Lord. Sanctify them, Father. Sanctify them through thy truth. The word is truth.